song that we will be singing is a, is a really famous, actually quite a well-known song, um, I Exalt Thee. And this song was, I don't know if one of some of you know, but this song was written um, in the 1977s when um, it was just starting to become quite popular to do the praise and worship in, in churches. Um, and it was actually based on the Psalm 97 verse 9. And uh, a guy called Pete Sanchez Jr. has actually wrote, written this song. And it says, For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted for above all gods. I exalt thee. And the question was asked, you know, how can there be other gods than our God, our Savior, the Lord? 
And I guess what they ref they're referring to here is basically just that these gods are not not things. It's li life things that we are we are sometimes praising and worshiping. You know, like money or you know our cars or our houses and things that we own. So it's not so much to to do with a god as such. Um, so yeah, if we want to just close our eyes for a prayer. Oh Lord, you are high above all the earth. You are greater than all that would compete for my alliance, uh, allegiance. You're greater than my family. You're greater than my desire for security. You're greater than my home and my possessions. You're greater than my work. You're greater than my country. You're greater than my accomplishments. You're greater than the wonders of creations. All praise to be to you, O oh God, for you are greater than everything. Amen. Thou Lord art of all the earth. Thou art exalted.
how high. Lord, you are so good to us. You are our Savior. And you're the miracle that happened to us. And we thank you for that. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord. I exalt. continue to exalt you for you are the almighty God loving and holy God without you there is no other God the living God who came down seeking for us and thank you for a loving God who found us on the cross. You redeem us. You bought us with a price. And that is the life of your dear son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We exalted you for you are worthy to be exalted and to be praised. We come cheerfully entering the gate, come into your court to praise you, to adore you, and to worship you. You are our God. You know what is happening. The omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, the God of all knowing. The Almighty God. Lord, search our heart and knows us. Forgive us anything that is not right with you. Lord, I pray that you forgive us. Open our mind and open our heart. Change us. Transform us to be more like you. By reading and toil in your word and walking with you in prayer and in the fellowship of believers. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your promise of provision. Thank you for your protection. Emmanuel, you never leave us. We love you so much. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for the pastor, Joel, and his family. As he leading us this year, Lord, we pray for special anoint, for wisdom. And we thank you for a man that you've given to us, answering our prayer. Bless us through him, Lord. The pastoral team, we commit to you, all the ladies in church. Bless them, Lord. So they can bless us. We pray for our children. Help us so that we can continue to train them in a way they should go. When they grow old, they will never depart from the truth. Your word is reliable, can revive our souls. Our hope is in you. We pray for those who are struggling, Lord. Those who are not feeling well. I pray for quick recovery. May this a symbol of glass of water, food, and the encouragement from our brothers and sisters help them to be on their feet. 
We thank you that we come to April. We're looking for the communion. And may these two elements remind us what you have done for us once and for all. I pray, Lord, that you prepare our heart and change us to be more like you. Anybody who is here or at home watching us, Lord, any urgent need, may we submit it to you who is able to change and you are the answer for our lives and our needs. We commit to you, Lord, those who are giving to support the extension of your ministry here on earth. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Lord, we love you. We thank you. There is life. You came with that life. And that is the light to every human life. We thank you for the change in people's life. People that live in sin in the world, they commit their life to you. What a freedom that we receive in you. We pray for the words today, Lord. Prepare our mind and our heart for your word. And may us surrender to you totally. Bless those who are giving. We love you. We pray and act this. In the lovely name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's some announcement. Those who are collecting the offering, please come forward. We do have milk in here. Food basket is love to bless you. Those who are here, there will be a lot out at the back there. If you're not here, you're watching us, call me and I'll give you some milk. There's a lot. Bless you. High school camp is coming up. It's from year 7s to year 12s, and it's at QCC Mapleton this year uh, from the 3rd of July to the 8th of July, um, and it costs $400 to come, so you should have come. This Easter, we have a few services coming up in Maryborough, 9am, Good Friday in Maryborough. And in 10am, Easter Sunday, and after the service, Easter Eggles! And in Harvey Bay, we have the 5 p.m. Easter Sunday service with a meal to share after the service. We hope to see you all there. Bye. <laughs> As always, we want to encourage you to visit our website, life-church.org.au. There you can find our connect cards, which you can fill out and give us some information if you're looking for areas to serve or if you have any prayer needs. Um, there's also a tab called Grow, which is where we have our discipleship curriculum. And we love to see people doing one-on-one -on -one discipleship using this awesome curriculum that we have. But go to our website, find some more information there, and we'll see you next week. Well, good morning. Um, those little milk cartons remind me of um, at, at school lunches in the U.S., you get like that little milk carton um, and it have like a puzzle on the back of it. Sometimes it'd be strawberry or chocolate. Anyway, um, I asked Emma this week, I had some of those. I was like, do you guys get those at school? And she had no idea what I was talking about. So anyway, um, I am glad to be here. I wasn't sure if I was going to be here because on Monday I started having these um, a runny nose and a sore throat and all of these, um, you know, symptoms that we're hearing a lot about. And after testing uh, for COVID six times, I was reminded that there's still colds and flus. Um, I don't think I have the flu, um, but I do. I'm recovering from a cold, um, so I'm thankful that it's not COVID. Um, but I'm still uh, hand sanitizing, and I might keep my distance a bit this morning because um, I don't think you want a cold either. All right. Um, so this morning, I have a question: Who here loves food? I love me some food. I love some food that is made with love. One of the things with uh, Grace and I recently moving to Harvey Bay is there's too many good places to eat. It's dangerous, both for my diet and for our pocketbook. Um, but we both love having food that is made with love to the perfect doneness, the perfect amount of spices and seasoning. Food is something that brings us together. 
Food is something that is universally around the world used for celebrating in all sorts of different cultures and ways of life. We recognize that food is something we do when we have a reason to celebrate. I don't know about you, but extended family gatherings might be a little bit of a hard sell if it wasn't for the food. Is there anyone else like that? <laughs> I don't know if I'd turn up to my uh, family gatherings as often if it wasn't for really, really good food. Um, and I still love, love my family. They're probably watching online. Um, in Australia, uh, we have Christmas and Easter and Australia Day where we get together and have these meals. In the U.S., you, you have um, Thanksgiving there. And with that, that's kind of the pinnacle of the food calendar in the U.S. Food is an important part of who we are as humans. And we associate certain foods with wealth. We associate food with a way to bless people when there's someone in need. Oftentimes, that's the first thing we do is we want to see that they have food, that they're looked after and their, their sustenance is looked after. Well, today's message is not about food, uh, not just about food, but we're going to talk about communion. And communion has been known by many different names over the last 2,000 years and has been practiced in many different ways, but it is part of who we are and what we do as believers of Jesus. Today, I want to talk about where it all started and where we are today. So in case you're wondering why we have these, uh, these little plastic cups that we take communion in, there's a history behind this. The most recent history is probably COVID because we used to have it up here and have, you know, little crackers that everyone would dip their germy fingers in and um, grab a little cup of juice, but I'm putting my germy fingers on this. And you have this little wafer in there that uh, kind of tastes like the packaging that it's inside of, I think. Um, but how did we get here? Um, so I want to talk about that. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. Um, that is going to be on the screens. It'll also be in your version Bible app notes if you use that. Um, so Luke 22, 14 through 20. It says, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So from the beginning of the church's existence, there has been this um, understanding that this is a part of who we are, and what we do as Christians, because Jesus led his disciples in this. This is something that we um, see that we ought to participate in as well. So, you know, some of our early records of the church and its practices come from the book of Acts. So in the very beginning of Acts, in Acts 2, um, it says uh, in verse 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions. Sorry, you lost my spot for a second there. And to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That sounds awesome to me. I don't know about you. Is this what church looks like for you? Well, many of you are thinking, no, like this is what church looks like for me. Obviously, I'm here. I'm not at home. Um, so this is what church looks like. But here's what I want to look at today is if this is your definition of church, this building, um, this hour service that we're together, I would ask that you would open your hearts and minds because I think church is so much bigger than that. I think we're missing out if this one hour we spend together and this building is church to you. 
And I've seen people who, who have this definition of church, that it's one hour a week and it's in this building, get burnt out because, because the service is maybe um, boring or it's over their heads or it's too loud or it's too quiet or it's not relevant or it's too new agey. Whatever the, the things are, we, we, we make church about this one-hour service, and, and we spend a lot of time critiquing it during the week and, and thinking about how this one hour could be better, and oftentimes we miss out on living in Christian church life outside of this building. So today we're going to talk about what that looks like because, because church isn't meant, and this is where we're going to get to, church isn't meant to just do in rows. Church is always meant to be done in circles, and it's a huge part of who we are as believers. So we come together here, and we, we worship God for who He is, and, and we, we, we praise God and celebrate the things that He's done, and, and we pray for those inside and outside of our church family, and we're challenged through the teaching of God's Word, but what we don't do on Sundays is practice. We don't practice our Christian life necessarily. Now, we do, this is part of our practice, but you could come here and sit on a seat. Um, I, the, the term used to be pew warmer, but the, these seats are warm enough. You don't need to, to warm them up. Um, but you could come here and sit in this building and not be a practicing Christian. You'd just be someone sitting in this building Anyone can show up here on a Sunday morning, but it's the practices that we do the other 167 hours of the week that make us a practicing Christian. So I want to talk about practice this morning, practicing the way of Jesus, and particularly in communion. Um, and when I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a video that I want to share with you. In this video, I know um, who, who's like watches the NBA? Anyone? Basketball, NBA. Lucas is like, yeah, NBA. Okay, so from the, the 90s to the 2000s, there was a, a very popular player named Allen Iverson, and um, he was known for having a bit of uh, arrogance, and he got asked a question one time in an interview um, in like a press conference. He said, hey, so uh, your coach has kind of been getting on you about not being at practice. Why do you not show up to practice? And here's his response. So let's look at the, the screens for that. So you and Coach Brown then settled the issue that he brought up on Saturday about practicing? If I can't practice, I can't practice, man. I'm hurt, I'm hurt. I mean, simple as that. It ain't about that. I mean, it's, it's not about that at all. You know what I'm saying? I mean, but it's it's it's, it's easy to, to to talk about. It's easy to sum it up when you just talk about practice. We sitting here. I supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, we talking about practice, not a game, not a game, not a game. We talking about practice, not a game, not a, not not the game that I go out there and, and die for and play every game like it's my last. Not the game. We're talking about practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? Man, we're talking about practice. I know I'm supposed to be there. I know I'm supposed to lead by example. I know that. And I'm not, I'm not shoving it aside, you know, like it don't mean anything. I know it's important. I do. I honestly do. But we're talking about practice, man. What are we talking about? Practice? We're talking about practice, man. We're, talk We're talking about practice. We're talking about practice. We ain't talking about the game. We're talking about practice, man. When you come in the arena and you see me play, you see me play, don't you? You see me give everything I got, right? But we're talking about practice right now. We're talking about practice. Man, I look, I hear you. I, it's funny to me, too. I mean, it's strange, it's strange to me, too. But we're talking about practice, man. We're not even talking about the game, the actual game, when it matters. We're talking about practice. 
We talk about practice. It's kind of an infamous uh, video that he just goes, we, we talk about practice. We talk about practice. And he gets uh, poked fun at a lot for that. But this happens in a lot of sports where you have this player who is just phenomenal. And they're so phenomenal that they're like, I don't need to show up for practice. And especially in the NBA, it seems to be more the case because basically it's like there's a coach just tell them to pass the ball to me. That's what they need to be practicing um, during the week is they, they need to practice how to throw the ball to me. I'll show up for the game and I'll make all the shots. But the reason I share that with you is because I think so often we as Christians have this attitude of we say, I show up every Sunday. I don't miss a single Sunday. Why do we need to talk about what I do during the week? That's my time. We don't need to talk about practice. I show up. You see me worshiping. You see me serving coffee or serving on worship team. We don't need to talk about practice because I'm there on Sundays. I do church. But here's my concern, church, is that this world that we live in is, is finding less and less importance on this one hour, and this world needs community. I was reading a New York Times article that was talking about how we are more connected as a culture than ever before, but for some reason, all around the world, we're seeing as, as, as technology gets put into new places in the world, the more connected cultures get through technology, the more isolated and lonely the people become. And we found that during these times of lockdown and COVID and, and this, these things of being told it's not safe to be with people. In 2022, we need community. And so I love to talk about practicing the ways of Jesus during the week and communion. Communion is at the center of that. It is one of the practices that I believe Jesus would be saying to us, church, you've got to be doing communion. So what is communion? Let, let's get into this. So communion is one word that's used for this act. And we're going to talk about a bunch of different words that is used um, when we talk about the bread and whatever Jesus did there with his, last, um, with his disciples at the Last Supper. Um, so, what is communion? Communion is um, translated from a Greek word, koinonia, which is defined as fellowship, association, community. Uh, the root word of koinonia is koinonos, which is actually about a partnership. And this is a partnership that two people would enter into at um, the altar in Jerusalem um, that was this significant um, camaraderie, companionship, partnership are the words that are associated with koinonos. So really, communion, that word, is about the gathering. It's saying what we do at the table is gathering together, and that's a significant part of what we're doing when we do communion. Um, but as far as eating uh, bread and drinking wine or grape juice, um, that isn't really referenced in this. So another term, we're going to go through a few of these, is the breaking of bread. And this is a term that is commonly used in the New Testament and then in the, the New Testament church. And Acts 2, it actually, the verse we just looked at, Acts 2.42, it, verses, it, it um, lists those as separate things. It says, um, it says koinonia uh, and the, the breaking of bread. So communion and the breaking of bread, because it's talking about how there was the fellowship and there was the meal. Those were both aspects of gathering as a church. In modern day terms, this term breaking of bread might be um, translated to like the slicing of bread, because this was back before fancy serrated knives, knives and um, both leavened, or in this case, this was a Passover meal, so it was unleavened bread. It would have been something a bit like, like this. Um, and so instead of getting out their fancy serrated knives and cutting it into even pieces, they broke it or they tore it. And they would pass this around the table or someone would break it into pieces. And so this was really a slang term for um, the, I'm, I'm going to leave this up here with my germy hands. Um, it was, this was a slang term for, for dinner. Um, so the Lord's, uh, sorry, so a, a example of this that I think of is when I first came to Australia, I had all these people who were saying, do you want to come over to our place for tea around six o'clock. The first thought that went through my head, 
was, they must be really bad at cooking because they just want me to come over for a cup of tea. Second thought is, I told you already, I love food. And I'm like, if we're drinking tea at six o'clock, what time am I going to eat dinner? Because like, I'm a hungry, growing boy. So I need some, need some food. And so for you guys, tea is a, I don't understand that, but tea, uh, this drink is somehow a slang term for dinner. That just is how it is. And I think in the same way, um, when they got together to eat a meal, they'd say, hey, let's break bread together. It didn't mean that necessarily every time they're breaking bread, they might have been on the keto diet or something and not having any carbs. But they um, use this term, breaking bread. So going into the next term, we'll show you the Midwestern American um, version of your tea. So another, um, if you were to travel to the Midwestern United States, someone would say, hey, why don't you come over to my place around 6 p.m. for supper? And you guys are like, what? 6 p.m. supper? What what are we going to be having at supper at 6 p.m.? But that's what they say in Midwestern United States. So the next term we're going to look at is the Lord's Supper. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 11, 20 through 32, this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, so then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. You see, Paul is making the distinction here to say, you might be getting together to break bread, to share a meal, but it's not the Lord's Supper. You might be having tea or or dinner, but it's not the Lord's Supper, the Jesus dinner, the covenant meal you are eating. See, this was a time before wristwatches and iPhones, So there was a long span of time between when everyone would arrive for like a dinner party. So you 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 also you couldn't call Susie when Susie was you know getting there and it was getting late in the night and everyone was getting impatient and hungry and call to check to make sure Susie isn't like sick at home with COVID or still um, you know doing something else. We're not going to be able to come anymore. Or is she she was going to bring the cob loaf? Is she still going to bring that? You couldn't call and do that. You just had to wait. And so what was happening in the church of Corinth is that um, as soon as people started flowing in, the food and the wine started flowing, and they were just eating and drinking as people would come. And Susie would be at home getting her cob loaf together that she spent every last dollar she had to, to bring this dish to the dinner. And, and she, she wanted to be a part of this dinner and commit everything she had to it. And she would show up and after working a, a long day or whatever, after hours, whatever that is, with this dish and walk in and all the food would be gone. Half the people there would be drunk. And Paul is saying, this isn't the Lord's Supper. That's just a bunch of people getting together. If you're gonna be impatient and hungry, eat at home and come so that you guys can do communion. You guys can do fellowship. You can make sure that you're all together, and the purpose of your gathering is to celebrate um, the Lord's death and resurrection. So another term often used for communion is the Eucharist. This term is actually not found in Scripture, but it is found, um, it it does date back to the first century. Um, The term is found in what's called the Didache, And the Didache um, was found around 18 to 1900, um, and it was a basically a church how-to book, uh, like the you know the the Church for Dummies book um, of how to do church. And if you're interested in this, you can literally go to thedidache.com, and there's an English translation of this text. It was written around the time of Revelation, and it's just all of the this is how you do, and one of the things is communion. But it refers to it as the Eucharist, which is a, uh, the Greek word is Eucharista, which simply means Thanksgiving. And this is actually where the holiday in America comes from, Thanksgiving. So um, when the, uh, the, the Puritans went to America, they planted their first crop and they prayed and fasted because they had no idea in, in three to four months 
if they would even have a crop, if the land was um, viable, if the weather was viable. And so they prayed and fasted that there would be a harvest. And when there was a harvest, they had a meal, a a Eucharist, a, a meal of thanksgiving for God's blessing. For us today, I believe this this term, Eucharist, Thanksgiving, it communicates what our heart postures should be in communion. Our gratitude for the work of Christ on the cross should pour into the gratitude we have for everything in our lives. When you eat, do you think about what it took to put that food on the table? And no, I don't mean like your mom or your dad saying, I worked hard to put food on this table. Maybe that's part of it. Um, But that's part of it. Also, what did it take for for this bread to to get here? Um, It had to be at a plant where they were packaging it and they were baking it. And then all of the the, the flour had to be processed somewhere and, and and a farmer somewhere farmed the wheat. What did it take for this food to go on your table? There's, there's great sacrifice that happens in everything that you eat. One of the things that um, I was reminded of when I was studying for this message is all life comes from death. In order for you to have a meal, something had to die in order for you to have that meal. Yes, even if you're vegan or vegetarian, you're, the plants had to die um, for you to, to live. And it's a reminder of the sacrifice of death to life. And, and we can remember in that the sacrifice of our Savior, the one who died for us to live. And I think in this time, um, just this is a side note, but right now we should be praying because it is planting season in Ukraine. A third of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine. I found that this week. And, and, and coming from an agricultural background, It is amazing to see that this world relies heavily on what we have on our table, relies on the weather and the conflict in another country. We are interdependent as human beings, and we should be so grateful for what we have. And it adds a layer of the prayer that we should have for the world around us. Um, the farmers at the moment aren't using their, their, their tractors for, uh, I don't know if you guys saw this, their tractors for plowing the fields are using them for stealing tanks. Um, I saw a video of that. Um, but we can pray for the agriculture in Ukraine right now. All life comes from death. Food is a daily reminder of sacrifice. Something died for you, and so did someone. We're reminded of our interdependence on one another and our dependence on the providence of God. I heard it said this way, I don't think food is a sign of God's goodness towards you. It is God's goodness towards you, right in front of you. I don't think food is a sign of God's goodness towards you. It is God's goodness towards you. Okay, one last term, and then we're going to move on to something else. So the agape feast, or the love feast. Feast. Can someone, oh, never mind. I was going to say, can someone tell me what agape means? And I totally just gave it away. Um, the agape feast. So agape is a Greek word for love. There's several words for love, and it's not um, brotherly love or romantic love. It's the love of Jesus that would lay down his life for someone else, and, and that love that brings and binds together the community of believers, the agape feast. And this is only used one time in Scripture, it's used, again, widely in the early church, um, but one time in the book of Jude, and Jude is addressing some people who were coming along to the party, um, coming along to communion for the wrong reasons. And he says, they are blemishes at your love feast. Watch out, because these people are sneaking into the big party for the wrong reasons, and they're talking to your people about stuff that isn't about Jesus, and you need to be careful. And so that's where this love feast we see reference in Scripture. But for us, I think it communicates that although we do reflect the death of Christ, it wasn't just It wasn't meant to be something where we're all sitting in rows, facing a stage with an electric drum kit and a keyboard on it, and, and, you know, whatever. And it wasn't just meant to be somber or sad. There's a time and a place for reflection, but there's also a time and a place for great celebration. 
We can throw a party, a feast, for the good things that the Lord has done. What do you do when you celebrate? You gather your friends and your family, and you put on some music, and you, you throw a barbecue. We can celebrate this community and, 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 the, and the sacrifice of Christ, but also it, it, it reminds us that we should be celebrating as a church the work of Jesus in our daily and our weekly lives. Paul, time and time again, is addressing the problem of getting drunk and communion. So why is that not a problem today? I'm not saying it should be a problem, but one is um, we use unfermented grape juice, um, so you're not going to get drunk off of it. Also, this is like this tiny little shot glass, so I don't think you're going to get drunk from that. Um, So I'm not advising that we start having Uh, parties where everyone gets drunk. In fact, we should look at Paul's words where he's saying, make sure you're having the Lord's Supper. Keep the main thing the main thing. But we are given permission in Scripture to to celebrate what the Lord has done. All right, so I want to move on here and go back to Luke 22 and the phrase that Jesus uses um, that we, is the reason we do this, is Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And there are two words that are a bit subjective in this, and um, there's a broad spectrum of the way churches practice communion, and I think it's largely because of these two words. One is remembrance. So remembrance is um, something that our church um, translated to say um, it's something we remember Christ's death and his punishment. This is scriptural. It says, um, I remember growing up in a Baptist church. This is very much the attitude. Um, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, it says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The cup at the Passover feast already signified uh, the remembrance of blood. But it was a different covenant. It was the covenant the Lord made with his people during the plagues in Egypt. The tenth and final plague was the killing of the firstborn by the angel of death. So in order for the Israelites to protect their firstborn, they had to um, put lamb's blood on their doorposts. And so the angel of death would pass over their their place of living, their house. Um, And so this is why it's called the Passover And this is why Jesus, before he goes to the cross, says this is the new covenant. And not in lamb's blood, he says in my blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. So this is what we should remember when we take communion. But I worry sometimes that we boil Jesus down to only being our suffering Savior. And if this is is Jesus, he might as well have been... um, sacrificed as a baby because Jesus lived a full life and taught us how to live. This is why we we look to the way of Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, do this in remembrance of what I did. He doesn't say, do this in remembrance of what I did on the cross. He says, do this in remembrance of me. When I was studying for this message, I heard it in illustration um, like this. So, a lot of people, if you live like in Australia, does everyone in Australia know how to swim? Like, I feel like you have to, otherwise you probably are going to drown somewhere. So you learn how to swim either um, through swim lessons. A lot of kids I grew up with didn't because we lived in a landlocked state. Um, so you didn't really have to learn how to swim as much. Anyway, um, you, when you learned how to swim, maybe you took swim lessons, maybe your parents taught you how to swim. Every time you get into a body of water, I would argue you remember your swim lessons. So when you go off the diving board, do you close your eyes and reflect on the, the color of togs you were wearing that day and the, the, the Blue's Clues towel that you had and your goggles as you sink to the bottom of the pool? No, you move your arms and your legs. You swim, but you remember your swim lessons, right? And the same in our faith as I think remembering is remembering the act uh, that Jesus did on the cross, but it's also living that out, saying, Jesus, show me how to move my arms and legs. Show me how to live like you lived. Let my life be transformed by you. Let the decisions of my future be influenced by you. All right, so the, the, the other word I want to reflect on 
um, and do this in remembrance of me is the word this. Jesus says, do this. Well, what exactly is this? Is it the physical act of breaking the bread? Is it, is it the eating of the bread and the drinking of the wine? Is it the words that Jesus says? Is it, is it the meal? Is it the gathering of believers around a table? So we have debated this as Christians for 2,000 years, and I think I, Pastor Caleb Maple of Life Church, have the answer. Are you ready for it? I think the answer is yes. Yes, all of the above. You see, the debate has been, what do we include in this one-hour service that we gather together on Sunday mornings? If Jesus said, do this, then we should, it should reflect our gatherings that we do for one hour a week on a Sunday morning. So this little cup is communion. At Life Church, it's how we do communion, but I would say, I hope, it's only one way that we do communion. And I would encourage you, would you let this be a symbol of a symbol? Don't let this tick the box to say, Jesus said, do communion, so I do this. Let's let this be a symbol of a symbol. After today's message, I hope you look at this little cup and you wonder, how did we get here? You aren't the only Christian in, in history who has asked that question. You see, the debates and the problems around communion have been around since the first communion. The disciples started arguing about who was the greatest, and then sometime in church history, this mysticism entered where they said, the, 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 this, um, when we pray, this turns into the, the actual, literal blood of Jesus. And this little wafer, that, that's, that is the, the bones and the body of Jesus. And there's all of this theology and communion became this big thing. And I think the place where communion became the furthest from what Jesus intended was in the Middle Ages in the 14th century. Communion was something that the priest would stand in front of the congregation and he would give the communion liturgy in Latin, which no one in the congregation understood. He would go behind a curtain. He would take communion for himself. And that was done. Tick the box. No one in the congregation took communion. In fact, there was a piece of furniture that they stored the communion elements in. Does anyone know, or could you have a guess of what the name of that uh, communion thing that they kept the communion in was called? Anyone? They called it the tabernacle. We have a picture of that? So the thing that Jesus said, I have torn the veil. When you come and you bring your, your, yourself to me, sit at the table, take on my forgiveness, do this in remembrance of me for my blood. This is a new covenant. We as Christians over a few hundred years said, yes, but this is this really holy thing and people are partying and it's becoming this thing that's getting out of hand and, and not everyone's doing it in the right heart. And, and, and the priests, we're, we're really holy. So we're going to go, we're going to go behind the curtain. We're going to keep these holy elements that are the blood and the, and the, the body of Jesus. We're going to keep them in this fancy piece of furniture so that no one can touch them, that no one can abuse them. And we went right back into the temple, into the tabernacle, where the Holy Spirit isn't. He is. The Holy Spirit's there. But the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is at the table where two or more are gathered. I am there also. And so where are we today, church? Are we behind the curtain or are we at the table? We're, we're here. But that's why we can't let this be all that communion is for us. We have to get back to the table. We need to return to the table because there's so much that Jesus had in mind when he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remember the sacrifice I made, but have community with one another. And I just wonder how much it would transform this world that people are wondering, what is it that the church offers 
What have we offered community gathered around a table? I hope that when you take this, we're going to take this today, but when you take this, you ask yourself, when is the last time I had someone over for dinner for the purpose of Jesus? Whether that is you meeting with other um, people just to, to catch up that are Christian, whether that's for the purpose of being hospitable to those who don't know Jesus yet, whether that's your life group. If you're not in a life group, we've been beating this drum, please get in a life group. Because that is the table, that is community. So I want to share with you that as a church leadership team, we want to get behind this idea that church doesn't just happen in rows, but church should be happening in circles. So starting the 24th of April, every six weeks, we're going to be having a meal where it's the pastors and we're going to kind of have pull some names out of a hat to have dinner with, with you guys, all of you in the congregation. And hold on because it, it, it might take a while to get around to you because we want it to be an intimate gathering where we can spend quality, intentional time with, with our community. Um, but I hope you're doing this too. It doesn't need to have a formula, and life groups is something that we do. It's our system of trying to get you to connect, but you don't have to just do a life group. You can have dinner with people and remember what Christ has done. So we're actually going to call these events Agape Feasts. So the first Agape Feast being the 24th of April, and that will be personal invites um, to those who we, we have all your names in the system and uh, in, our, in our church database, and, and it's people who aren't just here this morning. We have a large group of people who call this their church who aren't here every Sunday. Um, so we're going to take communion this morning, and we are going to take these little cups, but I want to do something a little different. Because, again, I think that this is something that Jesus intended to have in circles. So I asked a few people to be like leaders in communion. Could you stand up if I asked you to um, help lead communion this week? I might ask, Lynn, could I volunteer you as well? <laughs> She's always game to just like me throw her into things last minute. Um, could Helen, would you mind passing those around to the people standing that might not have one? So um, here's what we're going to do is uh, I've asked also a couple people to come pass out the communion cups. If you could come on up, um, they're up here. Um, and so in just a second, if you could uh, make your way to the front and there will be um, someone uh, giving communion out up here and someone up there, get yourself a communion cup. And then go find, go ahead and have a look around the room. Find someone who's standing up and go to their group. And we're going to do communion in circles today. And we're, um, I've given them a page that just has what's called the words of institution, which is just um, what we looked at in Luke 22. Um, but also, I have a question on there that I want us to go around as a group and say, what is one thing that you're thankful for today? What's one thing that you're thankful for today to remember that we can have a heart posture of gratitude in our communion? And then I'd like for us all to just pray as groups. So you can get up from your seats and we'll do that now. We're going to go ahead and uh, sing our closing song. And as we do, um, and we sing, this is my story, this is my song. Um, may we remember the story of, of Christ um, sitting and dining with his disciples and think about what that means for us. So let's sing this together.
If someone was to text, or to ask you to send them a picture of your church, like say, if they said, text me a picture of your church, what would you send them? A picture of you, a picture, maybe it would be of the stage, maybe it'd be of this building, maybe you'd get like a drone and fly it up there and take a picture. I want to show you a picture that is the oldest picture we have 
of the church. Um, and if, you, if you're on my uh, slides there, Harvey, for my message, this is called the uh, Fracto Panis Fresca, and it was found in a catacomb, catacomb in Rome, um, and they believe it dates back to about 100, 110 AD. And what do you notice about this picture? Around a table, there's plates, there's uh, cups, people are leaning into each other. Don't let this one hour that we gather together to be all that you call church. If you're walking away from today's message, I wanted to give you this one challenge. And it could start right here to this morning. Invite someone over for dinner and ask someone to go out to lunch with you. Someone in this room or someone you know who's not in this room, someone who doesn't know Jesus yet. We should be doing church around our tables. And I want to challenge you. And if all you know how to make is spaghetti bolognese, you'll get really good at making spaghetti bolognese. Um, but do community together. And there's such vulnerability that happens when we say, this is me. This is my home. It may not be the cleanest. It may not be um, what you do at home, but this is me. And that is where true community begins. And that's our heart, is that we would be a community where we are loving each other so well, seeking after God together, making a difference in our community and world through being tied together. So would you go this week? and do that. All right. Um, so just a reminder, Fukava's got the little um, American school lunch uh, cartons of milk. And uh, go out and grab some bread to take to your neighbors. That would be a great way to uh, maybe you could use that bread for a meal with your neighbor. Um, and do, uh, grab a cuppa on your way out, and we'll see you in the foyer. Thank you all.